Hey, good morning, guys. Kind of a sad day at my house. Well, yesterday was sadder. Remember last week when I talked about our new dog, Jack, and it just didn't work out. You know, sometimes pets don't work out with a family. And so we had to take him back where we got him from. And we were sad. But you know what? He wasn't. He, Even though he was really spoiled here and he was sleeping in my bed with me every night. And he was really good, and, and we would walk together so many times every day and play ball and catch and all that. But he and the cats did not get along. As a matter of fact, he, I had one of the cats in my lap, and he like um, jumped in my lap and attacked the cat. And so that was just it. And it's not that he was a bad dog. It's just that dogs are predators, which and so are cats, actually, <laughs> which means that, you know, God made them to hunt for food and they're different with different species. I love my cats, but I wouldn't want to be a bird or a mouse. Doesn't mean that they're bad. It just means that that's the way God made them. And not all dogs get along with cats and Jack doesn't get along with cats. So I took him back to where we got him and I made sure they knew all about Jack so they would find him the perfect family. And I'm sure he's going to be a very happy dog. They put him in with some puppies and he was licking them. So he just likes dogs. Sometimes we're like that too. We like people who are like us and we don't like people who aren't like us. But it's a really good thing that Jesus didn't feel that way, right? Because <laughs> none of us are anything like him, except for the fact that we have skin and brains and eyes and, and all that kind of stuff. But he's a son of God and you know, we're not, we're just humans. <laughs> so there's a lot of bad stuff that goes along with that. So anyway, a little bit sad about Jack, but I'm really happy for him because he's going to be much happier in a house without cats. And our cats are already really a lot happier without him. And my husband's just going to have to wait until we can find a little puppy because Jack was a grown up. And so Jack was used to doing things his own way, and he wasn't used to being around cats, and so that didn't work out. Anyway, so, you know, sometimes maybe you've gone through that too. Maybe you got a pet and they just didn't work out with the family, and that's just the way it is. You know, we're going to talk about kindness today. And you could say that, well, I should have been kinder to Jack by giving him more chances. It's like, no, when he has your cat in his mouth and actually he tried to attack another one too. So it's like, mm, then I have to be kind to the cats. But we're going to talk about that kind of stuff today, about what kindness is and what kindness isn't and how Jesus is kind and how God is kind and, um, Abraham and Sarah and Lot, we're going to talk about kindness a lot more when we get back to Genesis. And we've already talked about unkindness. We're going to talk a lot more about unkindness. Anyway, let's, um, I'm going to start the podcast. So just give me a minute. Hi, I'm Miss Tyler and welcome to this week's episode of Context for Kids, where I teach you guys stuff most adults don't even know. If this is your first time hearing, or if you've missed anything, you can find all the episodes archived at contextforkids.podbean.com, which has them downloadable, or at contextforkids.com, where I have transcripts for readers, or on my Context for Kids YouTube channel, where I usually post slightly longer video versions. All scripture this week comes from the MTV, which is the Miss Tyler version, and that's the CSB tweaked a little bit, Christian Standard Bible tweaked a little bit or a lot to make the context and the content more understandable for kids. Now, of all the ways to be like Jesus, being kind seems like it would be the easiest when actually it could be the most complicated. I suppose the best way to describe it is how people treat us better than we've treated them or when one person treats us better than everyone else does. There are a lot of ways to be kind, and some of them are very simple. But the truth is that kindness can be very hard when we're angry or hurting or confused. 
when we were learning about how Sarah and Abraham treated Hagar, neither of them were kind. And they wouldn't even call her by her name. But God called her by her name and made her promises even when everyone else was being hateful to her. We see that a lot in the Bible, where God is kind, where others are cruel, or when God is patient with someone when others want to just get rid of them. In fact, when we get to Genesis 19 and talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, we'll see a lot of kindness and unkindness. Even starting in chapter 18, when Abraham sees the three men traveling and who end up in his camp, he's kind to them and gives them a feast and even takes care of them personally. It's in the middle of the afternoon in ancient Israel with no air conditioning, and they have been traveling, so they would have to be very thirsty and hot. And he made sure that they had shade and milk and the best food he could provide. He didn't know who they were until later, but showed them kindness anyway when he could have treated them badly like unwelcome strangers or dangerous. That's a great example of kindness. In the next chapter, two of the men who are actually angels go to the city of Sodom to find out if all the people who are crying out to God because of the unkindness and cruelty of the men of the city are actually telling the truth. Abraham's nephew Lot goes out to them and convinces them to stay with him for the night because he knows how cruel and evil the men are and wants to protect them. That's another great example of kindness. But when the evil men of Sodom try to beat his door down to get at the strangers, Lot puts his own daughters in danger instead of the strangers or even himself. Well, that wasn't kind at all to them. Lot was kind and righteous compared to the people of Sodom, but that wasn't saying much. But we'll see in both situations that God is kind even when we aren't. God rewards Abraham with a son through his wife, Sarah, who hasn't ever been able to have babies. And God treats Lot with kindness by saving his life and the lives of his daughters, even though he was willing to hurt them terribly in order to look like a good host. Even when God destroyed those cities, it wasn't to be cruel, but to put an end to the evil those cities were doing to everyone else. Sometimes, kindness to one person means that another person needs to have consequences. Many years had gone by since God had helped Abraham save the people of Sodom from the four kings who had taken them all as slaves. We would hope that they would have changed their ways, but instead they got even worse and were hurting everyone who visited the town. The people in the Bible are very much like us. Sometimes we're kind and sometimes we're cruel. But God is always kinder than we deserve. Sometimes, a lot actually, when you read through the Bible, you will say, oh my gosh, God, don't be kind to that person. What are you even thinking about? Don't you see the terrible things they've done? But he doesn't listen to us and he's really kind anyway. But how are we supposed to know when to be kind and how kind to be? That's super hard. In fact, that's why this is part of the fruit of the Spirit, because we don't know on our own and God has to teach us as we become more and more like Jesus. The way we start out, most of us really don't want to be very kind when we aren't happy or even when we just have a headache, right? It's hard to be kind when we're only thinking about ourselves, and but that's how we all start out only able to think about ourselves. We think about our pain and our sadness and our anger and our feelings without really understanding that everyone else has all of these feelings inside them too. We forget how nice it is when we're feeling mean and someone is kind to us even though we said something nasty to them. 
And we realized that what we really needed was for someone to not be mean back to us. And what a relief it is when they're nice to us instead. I think that's why when we're kids, we can be so mean to our parents when we're feeling bad because we know that our parents aren't going to punch us out when we're mean to them like other people would. Now, sometimes being kind gets confused with being nice. A nice person is a person who's pleasant and agreeable, but that isn't always the right thing to be. If one person is bullying a smaller person and you're nice, you aren't going to deal with the fact that the bigger person is doing something very wrong. Instead, a nice person might try to make everyone feel better about themselves so they can be friends with everyone. A nice person doesn't want to make enemies, and so they'll just try to smooth everything over instead of dealing with what's going on. A mean person might just come in and beat the snot out of that bully. But what does a kind person do? A kind person makes sure that the bully stops what they're doing in such a way that the bully knows they're wrong, but the kind person also treats the bully better than they're treating the smaller person. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 25, we meet a bully named Nabal, a kind woman named Abigail, and a guy named David who is all over the place on how he treats people in the Bible, sometimes wisely, sometimes as a selfish bully, and you never know quite what David's going to do. David is a man after God's own heart, which means that he was God's choice for king of Israel, but that doesn't mean that David has a heart like God's. David loves God, but that doesn't mean he's like God. Sometimes we forget that. But in this story, David has been on the run for years from King Saul, who wants him dead. David makes his living by killing the enemies of Israel and taking their stuff. And wherever he's hiding out, he protects the people who own that land and the shepherds who are staying there with their flocks of sheep and goats. That's what David and the people with him have been doing for Nabal. But when a festival day comes, David sends people to Nabal to ask for some sheep to roast for a party, since they've been protecting his 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. That's a lot of sheep and goats. Well, at least I hope he was asking. You know, he did send 10 of his fighting men, and sometimes it's hard to know for sure. But the Bible tells us that Nabal was a harsh and evil man, and that the name Nabal means fool. By the way, and we've talked about this before, that's generally a clue in the Bible that we're not dealing with a person's real name because no one would actually name their kid that. The Bible does that a lot when someone's too shameful to be named. Like, the five kings in Genesis 14 who had the funny names, pretty much calling them all evil and nasty. Like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. No one would name their kids Sneezy or Dopey. I mean, that's just rude. Those were nicknames. But Nabal was a rich bully and very foolish, and he wasn't the slightest bit grateful to David and his men or even scared of them. He said some really nasty things about David, and sent the young man back to him. You see, not only wasn't Nabal kind, but he didn't even qualify as nice. And neither was David, because when he found out, he told all of the men with him that they were going to slaughter every man in Nabal's household by morning. And he even swore an oath, which was every bit as foolish as what Nabal was doing. Although David had treated the shepherds well in the past, now he was willing to be even more of a bully than Nabal. Nabal was just insulting David, but David was willing to kill innocent people in revenge. And you know who that sounds like? Sounds exactly like Lamech. Remember the guy, what was he in Genesis 4, who said he, you know... A young man hurt him, so he killed the guy. It's like, like, guy bruised him, so he killed him. This is really overkill. Well, that's what David's doing. 
But God wanted to teach David a lesson in kindness, so he sent Nabal's wife Abigail to David with a ton of the best food they had to offer. 200 loaves of bread, two huge jars of wine, five sheep all ready to be roasted, a hundred clusters of raisins still on the vines, and 200 sweet-pressed fig cakes for dessert. Wow! That was obviously what she'd been planning to feed her entire household for the feast day, but she gave it to David instead. Nabal, her husband, had been unkind to David and his men, and David was about to be even more unkind back. But the Bible tells us that Abigail was intelligent, so what she did was kindness to both sides. Here's what she did. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off the donkey and knelt down with her face to the ground and honored David. She knelt at his feet and said, I am so sorry, my lord, but please let your servant speak to you directly. Please listen to what I have to say. My lord, you should pay no attention to this worthless fool, Nabal. This was her husband, remember, because he really lives up to his name. His name means stupid, and stupidity is all he knows how to do. I didn't see the young men whom you sent. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, it's the Lord who kept you from murder and taking revenge. May your enemies and anyone who wants to hurt you be like Nabal, who is nothing but a fool. Please let this gift I have brought you be given to the young men who follow you. Please forgive everything we've done to offend you, because the Lord is certain to make a lasting dynasty for you, because you fight the Lord's battles. For as long as you live, do not do what is evil. King Saul is hunting you and wants to kill you, but your life is safely tucked away in the place where the Lord your God protects the living. But he's getting rid of your enemies by flinging away their lives like stones from a sling. When the Lord does for you all the good that he promised you and appoints you to rule over Israel, you don't want to feel guilty for taking revenge against all these men for what Nabal did to you when you know that God will take care of the problem for you. And when the Lord does good things for you, please remember me and do good things for me. And that's 1 Samuel 25 verses 23 through 31. Wow. And this is why Abigail is one of the wisest people in the whole Bible. Her parents in choosing Nabal as her husband, not so much. But when she found out the trouble that Nabal's unkindness had caused, she fought back with so much kindness that David didn't even know what had hit him. She gave him more than he'd asked for, and she even apologized for not being there to greet his men, even though it wasn't her fault. But even though she was kind to David, she still talked sense into him by reminding him that he is God's choice for king of Israel, and so he doesn't have to fight against people like Saul and Nabal, that God will fight those battles for him. Abigail tells David that murdering Nabal and all the men in her household isn't right, or even reasonable, and that he'll regret it if he does it. She was very smart in how she said it, and very kind and wise about how she handled the situation. If she just walked up and yelled at him for being prideful and a murderer, which was true, <laughs> probably he would have been angry enough to kill her too, but she was kind, and so her words worked their way into his heart, and he turned around, and even though he'd sworn an oath to kill all the men in her household, he didn't do it. In fact, David even thanked her for stopping him from killing everyone. Kindness is one of God's secret weapons against evil. What might Abigail have done if she was just nice? Well, maybe she would have gone to her husband Nabal and said, Oh, honey, do you really think it was a good idea to make those soldiers angry? Couldn't we give them something to eat? I'm not saying you were wrong or anything, just that we have a lot of food to spare and they're probably pretty hungry. And while she was trying to be nice to her husband, 
David would have marched up and killed everyone. No, with a man like Nabal, being nice doesn't solve anything. In the Proverbs, chapter 26, it tells us that we have to know when someone who is foolish should be spoken to and when they should be entirely left alone. In Nabal's case, Abigail knew it would be foolish of her to even talk to him about it, and that kindness to her household meant going behind his back and taking care of the problem herself. What if she'd just been nice to David and hadn't told him that murdering a whole household of men just because he got insulted by one guy is really, really evil? Well, David might not have killed her family, but he wouldn't have learned the lesson that God sent her to teach him. And the next time it happened, he would have just killed somebody else instead. God sent Abigail to David to teach him a lesson about trusting God and not taking matters into his own hands, and especially not when he's feeling too emotional to think straight. This wasn't a war where David was protecting farmers and ranchers from the Philistines or anything. This was just David being ticked off because he got disrespected. David wouldn't ever be a good king if he didn't learn from Abigail how to be kind and merciful to the people who weren't being kind and merciful to him. And we will see later that there were a lot of times when David could have lopped off the head of someone who was being nasty to him, but he didn't because of the lesson God taught him through Abigail, who became his wife when her husband died. She was right about everything. God took care of Nabal, just like she said he would. David would have murdered all those people for no reason at all. Abigail turned David to kindness on that day so that he and his men weren't guilty of murdering innocent people. What about Jesus? What did Jesus tell us about being kind, and how was he kind? Well, Jesus was always kind, even though he wasn't always nice. Abigail actually called her husband names when she was talking to David because, well, one, she knew it was true, but she also knew that it would help calm David down. But calling her husband a fool to his face wouldn't have accomplished anything at all. Sometimes Jesus was harsh with people who were hurting others because they had the power to do a lot of damage, and Jesus wanted them to stop. Jesus is different from us because he knows what is actually in people's hearts and on their minds, but we can only guess, and usually we get it wrong, and call people names just because we're angry and impatient and offended like David. But Jesus proved his kindness through the things he did to help the people who were hurting and by confronting the people who were hurting them. He healed people without blaming them for being sick or injured. He cast demons out of people without telling them it was their fault. He fed people without blaming them for being poor. Jesus did good things for people without embarrassing them for needing help. And we all need help sometimes. It's hard to get help when people make us feel bad for needing it or when they only help us so they can look good for doing it. Jesus helped people because they needed help and because that's what God's love looks like. Sometimes he even told the people he was helping not to tell anyone. Jesus told his followers that if they were kind, then they would care for the sick, get clothes for the people who needed them, visit people who were in prison, and take care of the people who have no one to care for them. He said that being kind to those people was the same thing as being kind to him, and not being kind to those people was the same thing as not being kind to him. But he went even further than that by telling us to pray for the people who do bad things to us and to be kind to them. He told us to be kind by forgiving people. Kindness is always an action word. Kind people do kind things. They don't just think kind thoughts. Kindness means doing whatever is needed for someone who has a need. In the ancient world, kindness meant hospitality, like when Abraham and Lot took care of the angelic visitors who came to them, even though they just seemed like human strangers. 
They treated them like important people and not just random strangers. That's what kindness does. It treats people better than they deserve to be treated just because they're made in the image of God. That's what Jesus did when he ate meals with people whom no one else would eat with, or when he touched the people whom no one else would touch, and spoke to the people whom no one else would talk to. Even when Jesus was angry, he was still kind and wanted to turn people around. When he died, it was for everyone he was ever frustrated with or angry at, and everyone who had ever insulted him or hurt him or even those who killed him. Without the kindness of Jesus, absolutely everyone who wasn't a Jew would still be worshiping idols. Jesus changed everything with his kindness, which is his Father's kindness towards us. Jesus could have just saved the Jewish people, his own family. But that wasn't enough because he is too kind and loving to stop there. Jesus died so everyone could be saved, no matter who they are and what they've done no matter who you are and what you've done too. And not just to save us, but to change us and heal us and help us in every way. You know, Jesus takes gang leaders and drug dealers and makes them into preachers and teachers and missionaries. Jesus takes murderers and makes them into the gentlest of people. Jesus can change anyone into anything because there's nothing that his Holy Spirit can't do in the heart of someone who is willing to change. And God is actually really persuasive when he wants us to change into someone entirely different, even sometimes when we don't want to. The Bible is full of people who did great things only because of the kindness of God or who are alive only because of the kindness of God. God's been proving his kindness since the beginning when he didn't kill the man and the woman in the garden on the spot, but just kept them away from the tree of life and even gave them clothing as a gift. God was kind when he didn't kill Cain, but protected him instead. God was very kind when he saved the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt along with everyone else who listened to the warnings of Moses and did what he told them to do. Our God is a God of kindness even when he has to hold us responsible for the bad things we sometimes do. That's what he told Moses when Moses asked to see him. Because he's kind, he gives us a lot of chances to get our act together. Way more than we wish he would when it's someone else doing the bad stuff. But because we can trust him to be kind to our enemies, it means we can also trust him to be kind to us. If God was as mean as a lot of people make him out to be, then none of us would still be here and the human race would have been gone a long time ago because we are super annoying. Kindness is one of God's secret weapons. And a lot of people are scared that if they're kind, that people will just walk over them and hurt them. Because we don't trust that God knows what he's talking about. We have to always treat people better than they deserve to be treated the way we would want to be treated. Kindness can look like a lot of things. Kindness can mean sending a murderer to jail so that they can't hurt anyone else, but making sure that they're treated fairly while they're there. Kindness can mean forgiving someone who is starving for stealing a loaf of bread and making sure that they get the help they need so they can stop stealing. Kindness means getting people the help they need when we can. Kindness is standing up to bullies without becoming bullies ourselves. Kindness means winning over people with God's love instead of getting revenge. Kindness is always about showing people how different God is from everyone else. There are many people out there who want to get their own way and do whatever they want to do, however they want to do it, no matter who gets hurt. And sometimes they do that while saying they are really serving God, but God never acts that way even though he can. And there isn't anything we can do about people acting like that. All right? Really knowing and serving God is about becoming kinder and not meaner. Meaner means that we're headed in the wrong direction and we need to turn around. 
It means that we're following the wrong sort of God because our God fights evil through being kind. It's easy to be kind to people who are kind to us, right? But what about people who are just plain nasty? Jesus said that anyone can be kind to the people who are kind to them. Even the worst of sinners can manage that if they want to. And so we can't go patting ourselves on the back whenever we're kind to the people who aren't giving us any reason not to be. It's easy to pray for the people we love and hard to pray for the people we hate. And I mean, not those nasty prayers where we want to pray, oh Lord, please make that dude suffer. That isn't praying for somebody, that's praying against them. It's perfectly all right to pray that they stop hurting people. In fact, that's a great prayer because God doesn't want them hurting people any more than you do. But an even better prayer is that our enemies come to know and love Jesus so that he can change them from people who do things that are terrible into people who can do things that are wonderful. That's what Jesus was talking about when he told us to bless our enemies and not curse them, to make sure they're always in our prayers. And so if we ever get a chance to hurt them, we won't do it. And when they need help, we will be willing to do that instead, just like Jesus does for us. I love you. I'm praying for you. And I want you to know that being kind isn't easy. But God will always teach kindness to the people who really want to learn it.